The Supplemental Vapor Intrusion Guidance Training Material presented herein is not regulation or water quality control plan or policy. This material is guidance to consider, but not to the exclusion of alternate methodologies. Training materials, including slides and recordings, are not binding on California environmental protection agencies or staff or on members of the public. Exceptions are citations of existing statutes, regulations, and water quality control plans and policy. Hello, and welcome to the Supplemental Vapor Intrusion Guidance Training, commonly referred to as SVIG Training, presented by the Cal EPA Vapor Intrusion Workgroup members from Department of Toxic Substances Control, California Water Boards, and Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. My name is Tina Yuris with the State Water Board Division of Water Quality, Site Cleanup, and Department of Defense Program, and I will be moderating this training. The SVIC training provides a general overview of the guidance document, the four-step approach, and attachments. The general overview covers VI basics and general information about implementation of the guidance document. The four-step approach provides details for each step, including a high-level overview of the steps revisions from the 2020 draft to final draft version. Attachments 1 through 4, lines of evidence, petroleum-specific considerations, sewers and other vapor conduits as preferential pathways for vapor intrusion, and groundwater as a line of evidence to evaluate vapor intrusion risk, covers additional VI considerations. For questions about this training, please contact the Cal EPA Vapor Intrusion Workgroup. Now, let's get this training started with an introduction to the SVIG. Hello, I'm Cheryl Prowell. I'm the supervisor of the UST and Site Cleanup Program section at the State Water Board, and I will be presenting this section today. This slide gives a brief overview of major milestones in evaluating vapor intrusion. Cal EPA related milestones are shown in purple. Back in the 80s and 90s, there were early efforts at modeling and testing for indoor air, including the 1991 Johnson-Ettinger model that many of you may have heard of. In addition, the first guidance documents related to evaluating vapor intrusion were published during this time. In 2002, EPA published its first draft vapor intrusion guidance. This was followed shortly by DTSC's draft vapor intrusion guidance in 2004 and by OWEHA's California Human Health Screening Levels in 2005. As agencies came to understand more about vapor intrusion, updated DTSC, Water Board, and US EPA guidance documents were released from 2011 to 2015. In 2014, US EPA Region 9 developed short-term action levels for TCE, highlighting the health risks and need to take prompt action for vapor intrusion cases. The Cal EPA Vapor Intrusion Workgroup was formed to develop statewide consistency in the approach used to evaluate vapor intrusion and to screen potential vapor intrusion health risks earlier in the site investigation process. The work group prepared the draft supplemental vapor intrusion guidance released to the public in February 2020, shown in red, and after a comment period, the final draft was released this February. The main purposes of the supplemental guidance are to improve vapor intrusion assessments by incorporating new science, continue to protect human health and conduct early screening for potential vapor intrusion, and promote a standard process for assessing vapor intrusion acceptable by all oversight agencies. We do this through a four-step process, beginning with prioritizing buildings and selecting the appropriate sampling approach, screening with soil gas, conducting an indoor air investigation, and then managing the risk. When do we consider vapor intrusion? This slide shows the life cycle of a case. It uses circular language, which is commonly used in the DOD or DTSC process. The regional boards may use slightly different terms for the steps, but the concepts are the same. We begin considering vapor intrusion at the investigation or initial screening stage. We should be considering vapor intrusion as we start to develop conceptual site models and understand who may be at risk. 
we continue considering and checking our assumptions as the case progresses. For older cases, if there was not a good screening for vapor intrusion early on, use this training as an impetus to start now. As the science evolves, it's good to check our assumptions at major milestones, including the five-year review. Now let's get into the guidance itself. What does it do? It provides a stepwise process for building specific vapor intrusion assessments. It uses a multiple lines of evidence approach. It provides appropriate sampling procedures to help practitioners and regulators get important data for decision making. It uses US EPA's 0.03 attenuation factor for screening. It allows alternative approaches to using US EPA's attenuation factors when it is scientifically sound and technically supported. It promotes a consistent risk management framework. What it doesn't do is provide guidance for the overall site investigation for all media of concern, such as soil or groundwater, and it doesn't apply to petroleum underground storage tank sites, but it does offer guidance for other petroleum type releases. These are some common questions that we get about the final draft vapor intrusion guidance. First, are we still receiving comments? The public comment period was held from February to June of 2020. The final draft version was updated in response to the comments that we received and includes a response to comments. Can we cite this even with draft in the title? Yes, it is available for use and represents a consensus approach agreed to by DTSC, OWEHA, and the Water Board. Can you use other approaches? Yes, alternate approaches should be justified, and in many cases, the guidance provides factors to consider when evaluating the alternate approaches. Why use the 0.03 vapor attenuation factor? This attenuation factor is based on federal US EPA guidance. It provides protectiveness at most sites for unrestricted land use. And it is appropriate when information about the subsurface or building is limited. 24 of 28 states with guidance use attenuation factors equal to or more conservative than this number. We get a lot of questions asking if we should use DTSC's attenuation factor study database. Here's some information about that database. The study represents the best available science and a great compilation of vapor intrusion data in California prior to 2020. It's an analysis of primarily commercial site data in California. The study does have some limitations, however. It does not provide a sufficient basis for policy decisions. It does not account for all of the factors that contribute to variability, especially things like whether the air conditioning or heating systems were turned on. And it does not represent all building types. Most of the buildings in the study were commercial. There were very few residential buildings, and all of them were in Southern California. So due to these limitations, the study should not be used as a line of evidence in site-specific evaluations. Using the supplemental guidance approach, vapor intrusion data and building information will be collected and added to the GeoTracker database. This data will be used to reevaluate attenuation factor assumptions to build a stronger and more accurate assessment tool. Does this conflict with the underground storage tank policy? First, I'll remind you that for underground storage tank sites, they must be regulated by the Water Board or a certified local oversight program and follow the UST policy for all closure decisions on those cases. During the response to comments period, we did update the guidance to be more consistent with the policy and make it clear that the science is similar the vapor intrusion threat to petroleum is frequently reduced by biodegradation. This is true for an underground storage tank case, as well as for larger petroleum releases. Attachment 2 provides petroleum-specific considerations similar to the low threat closure policy, which can be used for non-UST petroleum sites. How do you use guidance? Guidance documents are tools 
they aren't requirements or regulations. Think of vapor intrusion guidance documents as a menu of tools. The vapor intrusion guidance is one of these tools. It represents current science. It presents a good technical approach. It describes factors to consider in site-specific decisions. It provides options and describes when other approaches may be appropriate. It is not a prescriptive cookbook. And we need policy for enforceable minimum requirements. This is an online training, so I'm not taking live questions and answers, but I'll remind you that if you do have questions, please submit them to the Vapor Intrusion email box for the Water Board or DTSC, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks. Welcome to this Vapor Intrusion Basics uh, training module for the Supplemental Vapor Intrusion Guidance document that was released by Cal EPA Vapor Intrusion Work Group in February 20. 23. My name is Steve McMasters. I am the Site Cleanup and Department of Defense Program Unit Lead here at the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Water Quality. So the purpose of this training is to provide you uh, an overview on vapor intrusion uh, basics as well as vapor intrusion behavior and some of the nuances and complexity associated with that as well as uh, provide you a little bit about the uh, terminology that we use in the field for vapor intrusion. All right, let's get into some of the basics on vapor intrusion. First of all, vapor intrusion is the migration of vapor forming chemicals or VFCs in the vapor phase that move from areas of contamination in the subsurface and migrate up into a building. Subslab Soil gas is the vapors that exist immediately below a building's foundation, whereas crawl space air, which is not shown on this figure before you, are the vapors that exist within a crawl space for a raised foundation type building. Soil gas or soil vapor is the vapors found within a VADO zone due to off-gassing of source areas or contaminated groundwater. Indoor air is the vapors within a building that is subject to air exchange with outdoor air and potentially subsurface air. Ambient air and outdoor air, they all are, they're a little bit different, but ambient air is the vapors outside of a building that would be reflective of normal atmospheric concentrations. Whereas an outdoor air is also outside a building, but is collected in proximity to a building and ideally upwind to determine outside source vapors that may be influencing indoor air concentrations. Lastly, preferential pathways and or vapor conduits are typically utility lines that are prone to transmission of source vapors directly to a building or beneath the building. An example would be a sewer lateral that intersects contaminated groundwater, soil gas, or the source directly. Uh, additionally, high permeable soils or geologic formations and strata may also act as a preferential pathway or conduit if it provides communication between the source soil gas and that building. All right, so within a soil matrix, vapors exist and move through voids between soil particles. As such, soil moisture and water saturation plays a big role in limiting or attenuating vapor migration. Additionally, caution and necessary steps should be conducted prior to collection of indoor air samples as many household products and items can off-gas and contribute to indoor air concentrations. Examples are gun cleaners, paint, and furniture treated with stain-resistant substances. Uh, there are a couple links in the lower left-hand corner of this slide that directs you to both the uh, California Air Resources Board and US EPA for some indoor air source studies for your reference. All right, let's transition now into the vapor behavior and summarize partitioning. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on partitioning on NAPL or non-aqueous phase liquid, which has a four-phase equilibrium partitioning between the NAPL, sorbed, dissolved, and vapor phases, as this would take significant time to discuss all the controlling factors that influence the equilibrium between those phases. Additionally, I'd like to thank Mr. Eric McWayne with the National Environmental Management Academy, um, who is one of our contractors that routinely provides fate and transport training to our cleanup staff. Uh, thank you, Eric, if you are listening to this, uh, for giving us permission to use this very valuable figure. <laughs>
Okay, so let's get into the two processes for chemicals to enter into the vapor phase. Uh, the first is the NAPL to uh, vapor process, which is determined by Routes law for mixtures, and then um, vapor pressure for those pure substances. Uh, the second is the dissolve to vapor phase, which is determined by Henry's law. So some of the general things to take away is that the higher the numbers, uh, either for Routes law or vapor pressure or uh, Henry's law, it is easier for that chemical to partition it into the vapor phase. So vapor is moved by two processes. First is by advection, where ke chemicals move within a moving air vapor mass, likely caused by differential pressures. The second is by diffusion, where there's thermal movement of chemicals from high to low concentrations. Some general things to take away is that vapor behavior is inherently complex and dynamic. In general, the closer we get to a building's foundation and ground surface, the more variability is observed. Uh, these variations are due to natural and man-made controlling factors. Some examples of natural factors include temperature, atmospheric pressure, uh, wind, precipitation, climate, soil type, and soil moisture. Some examples of man-made factors include heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC operation, which can cause pressure differences between the building and the subsurface. Heating can also cause something called the stack effect, as the hot air rises within a building which can draw subsurface vapors into a building. Lastly, building types, their condition, foundation type, and foundation condition can either hinder or enhance vapor migration. To help demonstrate the dynamic nature and vapor behavior, uh, this figure and findings are captured from a case study from the Sun Devil Manor residence overlying a shallow chlorinated hydrocarbon groundwater plume from the Hill Air Force Base in Utah. This residence was part of a multi-year study and monitored for just under a three-year period under natural conditions. So during this time, there was no mitigation or any remediation uh, during this whole period, nothing to um, influence uh, vapor behavior. So some of the lessons learned from this case study is that more variability in concentrations is observed the farther from the groundwater source Subslab soil gas concentrations should be between 10 times to 100 times in spatial variation and 10 times in temporal variation. Lastly, indoor air concentrations show temporal variation up to 1,000 times. To help demonstrate the wide range in temporal variability in indoor air, this graph shows the TCE or trichloroethylene concentrations from 8,000 samples collected the Sun Devil Manor residence just under that three year period uh, under those natural conditions. So data show significant concentration variation in a single day and also between seasons. Uh, additionally, there was much greater concentration variation during the winter months versus those observed during spring months. So the question I have for you all as you look at this data is what if this building was sampled for indoor air just once? What conclusion would we draw if we got a 0.54 micrograms per cubic meter value? What conclusions would we draw if we got 54 micrograms per cubic meter? Considering our short-term action levels of two micrograms per cubic meter for TCE for residential scenarios. All right, let's talk a little bit about the slab capping effect. So buildings, pavement, and other structures can impede ambient air and atmospheric interactions with soil gas. As a result, contaminant vapors can pool below structures. As a general rule, not absolute, but as a general rule, soil gas concentrations found at 10 to 15 feet below the building's foundation and at locations less than 10 feet laterally from that building can be used to estimate subslab soil gas concentrations. Thus, that's why those sample locations and depths are recommended as part of the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance. Additionally, we just want to point out that the number and degree of slab capping effect is going to vary depending on site and geologic conditions. Before we get into the next topic, uh, let's discuss what screening levels are and why they are important. So screening levels are a risk-based concentration for contaminants 
and considered protective for human exposure over a lifetime. They include measurements of how toxic the chemical is and also how long people will be exposed. As such, screening levels are developed for both commercial and residential settings separately. So commercial is based on a 40 hour work week where you have potential exposure for eight hours a day for five days a week. Whereas residential levels are based on a 24 hour, seven days a week scenario. As such, residential screening levels are typically much lower than commercial levels. So as such, an acceptable risk level is set based on a one in one million chance of cancer and also a non-cancer or acute health effects as well. Uh, the last point is that screening levels are generic in nature and calculated without site-specific information. Uh, they can be recalculated with site-specific information. Okay, let's get a little bit into uh, attenuation and attenuation factors as they are an important concept or uh, component of the uh, supplemental vapor intrusion guidance. So attenuation uh, is the reduction of vapor concentrations and impediment of vapor migration due to natural or man-made factors. Uh, attenuation factor is the ratio between measured concentrations between two media. So for this example, I am using the indoor air to subslab uh, concentrations as part of that ratio. So an attenuation factor for screening or a screening attenuation factor is a formula-based approach used to conservatively estimate indoor air concentrations from subslab or soil gas concentrations. In this example, we use the formula-based approach to estimate indoor air concentration using US EPA's uh, default attenuation factor 0 0.03. So if we have a subslab soil concentration of 1200 micrograms per cubic meter, then we can estimate an indoor air concentration of 36 micrograms per cubic meter. Just remember that using this approach should not be used to predict values, but to estimate a conservative value for screening. So in addition to the generic attenuation factors discussed in the previous slide, building specific and site specific attenuation factors can be developed with a robust data set. So building specific attenuation factors uh, should be based on collection of measured attenuation factors for a given building for a specific time period. Additionally, it's likely that you're gonna observe a range of attenuation factors for different sampling events. So for a site specific attenuation factor, um, those should be based on collection of measured attenuation factors for site specific buildings. I did wanna exercise caution with these approaches uh, as vapor will behave differently for every building. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the contaminated groundwater and soil gas relationship. Uh, indoor air concentrations can be estimated from groundwater concentrations. However, uh, this method is not preferred as a lot of air can be introduced. Uh, additionally, if you're gonna use this method, uh, the, the capillary fringe needs to be considered as its thickness and degree of contamination varies and creates a lot of uncertainty about the transport of chemicals through it. So the preferred method is get that uh, representative soil gas sample to estimate your indoor air concentration. However, there are scenarios and situations where a soil gas uh, sample cannot be collected, uh, such as a shallow groundwater scenario or very limited access to buildings. So in those situations, uh, you can use uh, a formula-based approach to help you estimate your indoor air concentrations. So if that is necessary, uh, this following formula can be used to estimate your indoor air concentrations, uh, but it needs to be done in steps. The first step is to um, take your groundwater concentration and convert that into a vapor concentration by uh, multiplying the groundwater concentration by the chemical specific Henry law constant. Then that value needs to be multiplied by a thousand liters over cubic meter. Then you take that value and you multiply it by a generic groundwater to indoor air attenuation factor, which accounts for the capillary fringe effects. So EPA recommends um, using 0 0.001 for generic scenarios, meaning all types of soil types, fine to grain. Uh, but if you have really good control of your strata and it is a clay deposit and pretty continuous throughout your site, um, a 0 0.0005 
um, generic attenuation factor is appropriate to be used. So that concludes my portion of the training today. Uh, we will be hosting live Q&A sessions on this in the near future, and that will be posted. So hopefully uh, you spent some time with the other modules. Mine was just the purpose of getting you uh, familiar with some of the terminology and vapor behavior. Uh, we're going to go into a lot more detail on these other modules, so please listen to them. All right, well, thank you for your time today, and I am signing off. Thank you. The first step for screening and evaluating vapor intrusion is prioritizing buildings and selecting the sampling approach. In response to public comment, the final draft supplemental vapor intrusion guidance was revised to add language to justify the 100-foot inclusion zone and language allowing a reduced separation distance for non-underground storage tank petroleum releases. When acute or short-term exposures may result in adverse health effects, the need for immediate action and expedited turnaround times for laboratory analyses should be evaluated. If subsurface vapor forming chemical contamination is suspected at locations near or adjacent to existing buildings, planning for public outreach should begin immediately. Public participation specialists should be involved when considering indoor air sampling. Preliminary conceptual site models should be developed to facilitate building prioritization. Buildings should be prioritized based on their proximity to the greatest subsurface contaminant concentrations whether in the VATO zone or in the groundwater plume. The closer a building is to subsurface contamination, the greater the potential for vapor intrusion. Buildings within 100 feet of the release area and those overlying contaminated groundwater with high vapor forming chemical concentrations should be prioritized. Buildings potentially connected vapor forming chemicals in the subsurface through vapor conduits such as sewer lines, drains, or other pipes should be prioritized. Buildings that are currently occupied should also be given priority for vapor intrusion evaluation. In some situations, existing lines of evidence can be used to determine if soil gas sampling will be useful for screening or if it is more appropriate to go directly to indoor air sampling. Some examples of situations that warrant proceeding to indoor air sampling include a known or suspected release area directly below a building, buildings near a significantly contaminated groundwater plume, sites with groundwater shallower than five feet beneath a building, and buildings connected to vapor conduits that intersect significant levels of contamination. Second step in the process is the evaluation of vapor intrusion risk using soil gas data. In response to public comment, the final draft supplemental vapor intrusion guidance was revised, one, to clarify recommendations regarding soil gas sampling depths for existing and future buildings, two, to clarify recommendations regarding how the capping effect impacts soil gas sampling design, three, to add an attachment describing lines of evidence and their use, and four, to explain the limitation of passive samples. Step two describes a general strategy to integrate vapor intrusion screening into overall soil gas contamination investigations. Collecting and analyzing soil gas concentration data as a primary line of evidence for vapor intrusion is an appropriate early screening step to evaluate the potential for vapor intrusion. Soil gas concentration data is generally preferred as a line of evidence for assessing vapor intrusion risk over groundwater or soil matrix concentration data for several reasons, including soil gas is most closely associated with emissions from subsurface contaminated media, uncertainty in predicting contaminant partitioning from groundwater or soil moisture to soil gas due to uncertainty in organic content in soil, moisture content, and Henry's Law constant, uncertainty in predicting transport through the capillary fringe, heterogeneity in the soil matrix, Soil matrix sampling is subject to loss of volatiles, and the standard reporting limits for vapor forming chemicals in soil, 5 micrograms per kilogram, are typically greater than estimated levels of concern for some vapor forming chemicals. Soil matrix samples can be qualitative indicators of a release area, but are not acceptable for calculating vapor intrusion risk. For step 2a, the distribution of shallow soil gas contamination should be evaluated. The objective is to evaluate the nature, distribution, and extent of shallow soil gas contamination, both laterally and vertically, and use that information to evaluate vapor intrusion risk to building occupants. 
For evaluating the lateral distribution of shallow soil gas contamination, soil gas sample locations should be selected to help identify release areas and the distribution of contamination. Soil gas sampling locations should initially be based on the location of known or suspected releases and laterally step out following a grid or radial sampling pattern. Samples should be spaced to provide a good understanding of the location of all release areas and a conceptual understanding of how soil gas contamination can be transported from those areas to current and likely future buildings. Specific locations Selected for soil gas sampling to assess each building should include areas between the building and the nearest vapor source and laterally as close as possible to the target building. Sampling should continue until the extent and distribution of contamination is reasonably understood. For evaluating the vertical distribution of shallow soil gas contamination, Soil gas samples should be collected from multiple depths to generate a depth profile and provide a reasonable understanding of the vertical soil gas distribution to help identify the greatest shallow soil gas concentrations. Soil gas samples should be collected from at least two depths, targeting depths of known or suspected shallow contamination and providing good coverage of the recommended sampling range. In general, soil gas samples should be collected from two depths within the recommended sampling range of 5 to 25 feet below ground surface. In the example presented here, a sample is collected at a depth just above a known shallow groundwater plume, and a second sample is collected in the middle of the Vado zone near suspected soil contamination. For soil gas samples collected to evaluate vapor intrusion risk to building occupants, the sample depths should consider the slab capping effect, which is a result of a concrete slab acting as a barrier or cap limiting the downward flow of ambient air and the upward venting of contaminated soil gas. Specifically, less attenuation is expected beneath buildings with a slab due to the slab capping effect. Therefore, for buildings with slab on grade or basement foundations, Vapor forming chemical concentrations collected from exterior soil gas samples located at deeper depths are less likely to underestimate sub slab soil gas concentrations compared to shallower exterior soil gas samples. Figures on this slide to conceptual model scenarios for the vapor intrusion pathway considering the slab capping effect. Contaminant plume migration and seasonal factors, such as weather conditions, groundwater levels, soil temperature, and soil moisture, can cause significant temporal variability in soil gas concentrations. When risk calculated from a single sampling event is below the points of departure, at least one additional sampling event is recommended for concluding that subsurface contamination is unlikely to pose a health risk. Additional sampling reduces the potential for underestimating vapor intrusion risk caused by temporal variability. Sampling events should occur in different seasons as determined by average seasonal temperatures, precipitation, or fluctuations in depth to groundwater. Additional sampling events may not be warranted if vapor forming chemicals are not detected in any environmental media within 100 feet and other lines of evidence agree that vapor intrusion is unlikely such as the soil gas plume being stable. This slide shows a flow chart of the process for screening buildings using soil gas data. The process starts with the collection of soil gas data and the evaluation of those data to estimate the risk and hazard using the maximum soil gas concentration and an attenuation factor of 0.03. If the estimated risk exceeds the point of departure of 1 times 10 to the minus 6, or the estimated hazard index exceeds the point of departure of one, proceed to an indoor air investigation at current buildings. If after the first round of soil gas sampling, estimated risk does not exceed the points of departure, then a second round of sampling should be conducted to evaluate temporal variability. If vapor forming chemicals were not detected in any environmental media, or if after the additional sampling events, risk and hazard are confirmed to be below the points of departure and lines of evidence are generally consistent, the building is considered low priority 
for further vapor intrusion evaluation. Note that an alternative attenuation factor can be used if supported by adequate technical lines of evidence. In early 2019, DTSC compiled and analyzed subsurface and indoor air data from sites in California contaminated with chlorinated vapor forming chemicals to improve its knowledge and understanding of vapor intrusion. The study collected data from 52 sites located in 16 of California's 58 counties. These data consisted of 4,972 paired subsurface and indoor air measurements taken from 262 buildings. The data set was filtered for contaminant source strength, removing paired measurements with subsurface concentrations less than 50 times background concentrations. The data set is limited to only non-petroleum contaminants, excludes post-remediation data, and contained no data from buildings with basements. The vapor intrusion attenuation factor study is subject to several limitations. The data set is comprised primarily of data from commercial sites. Only 42 measured pairs of residential subslab data remained in the data set after source strength filtering. Similarly, residential soil gas data was heavily impacted by source strength filtering, and 76% of the remaining residential soil gas paired measurements come from one site. These limitations make any statewide inference of residential subslab or soil gas attenuation challenging. The non-residential buildings in the data set include a wide spectrum of building types, from very small retail businesses with minimum air exchange to very large industrial warehouses with high air exchange. Attenuation factors for different types of non-residential buildings were not evaluated. Dataset lacks information concerning the operation of the HVAC systems during indoor air testing for most buildings or the presence of preferential vapor migration pathways. Hence, the influence of HVAC operation and preferential pathways is unknown. The dataset has a large proportion of buildings with multiple data pairs, and the statistical independence of those data pairs is unknown. Data that are not independent could bias the statistical analysis. The DTSC Attenuation Factor Study Database is comprised of subsurface and indoor air data collected primarily from commercial sites in California prior to 2020. The DTSC Attenuation Factor Study Database is subject to several limitations such as a reliance on data from commercial sites and a lack of data sufficient to account for the factors that influence the variability in vapor forming chemical concentrations. Therefore, the DTSC Attenuation Factor Study Database does not provide a sufficient basis for policy decisions to establish vapor intrusion attenuation factors. The Supplemental Vapor Intrusion Guidance calls for the collection of additional vapor forming chemical concentration data in various media along with relevant building specific data under better controlled conditions. This information will be added to the GeoTracker database where it can be used to reevaluate attenuation factor assumptions to build a stronger and more accurate assessment tool. Hi, I'm Jessica Law, engineering geologist with the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board. I will be going over step three of the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance, which covers the indoor air investigation portion. The image on the left is just a snapshot of the flow chart that is at the beginning of the supplemental guidance that covers those key points within step three. It is a great quick reference guide for the various steps within step three, indoor air investigation. To start off, I just want to briefly cover the changes that were made to step three in regards to the public comments that were received during the public comment period on the draft guidance. There were two generalized public comments received. The first one was conducting sampling with the ventilation system off can be uncomfortable or unsafe. And the revision that was made to the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance was it was revised to indicate that sampling under this condition should only be conducted when safe and feasible, and other alternatives are mentioned in the supplemental guidance. The next generalized public comment that was received is the conceptual site model should be the primary tool to determine the appropriate number of samples for the indoor air investigation. 
There was no change to the supplemental guidance because the text already indicates that the results of the building survey should be used to design the number and location of samples for the indoor air investigation. Now I want to move on to the various steps within the supplemental guidance for step three. The first step, step 3A, is public participation. Public participation should be considered early and often throughout the project life cycle, and this step is just highlighting public participation from an indoor air sampling point. The primary objective here is to create open communication to clearly explain what to expect and to address concerns. This can improve credibility. It will help reduce delays and receive broader public support, which should lead to a cooperative working relationship with stakeholders. It is important to acknowledge, evaluate, and address concerns throughout the investigation, evaluation, and if necessary, mitigation process. It's important to be flexible with owners and occupants when looking for indoor air sources, placing sampling equipment, and installing sub-slab probes. Next for the indoor air investigation step is step 3B, which is conducting an in-depth evaluation of the building. To do this, you would want to use the building survey form, which can be found in attachment six of the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance. The survey includes visually examining the building inside and out, as well as the surrounding area. The survey also includes reviewing the building layout and drawings, interviewing occupants, and conducting field screening. The survey should be documented on the building survey form and included within the report that's documenting the indoor air sampling activities. This building survey will support development of a conceptual understanding of how vapor intrusion may be occurring at the building. The building survey assists and supports the design of a building specific sampling plan. It will support the identification and addressing of indoor air sources of vapor forming chemicals and can help with the interpretation of those indoor air sampling results. The more complete that the building survey form is, the stronger conceptual understanding that you will have and a better interpretation of those sampling results. Next is step 3C, which is evaluating the spatial distribution of contamination inside and beneath the building. First off, it is important to have those co-located indoor air and sub-slab sampling locations where you have the location of people, where there are slab penetrations, and in the areas of suspected highest concentrations. It is important to start with three plus locations based on, again, that building survey that was conducted in the previous step and having those outdoor ambient air sample locations. Then there are additional lines of evidence, which can be your differential pressure measurements, exterior soil gas sampling, vapor conduit sampling, vapor entry point air sampling, whatever additional information that can help support this vapor intrusion evaluation. The next step is 3D, which is assessing risk using the, those maximum indoor air and sub-slab soil gas concentrations. First, we want to determine if vapor intrusion is occurring by evaluating the indoor air results with all available lines of evidence. You want to compare the subsurface concentrations to the indoor air sampling results. Does your site have any indicator chemicals detected in the subsurface and indoor air to assist in that evaluation? Evaluating the outdoor air results. Is there the presence of an indoor air source that is not found in the subsurface? What are the vapor conduit air results or the vapor entry point results? Now, if vapor intrusion is determined in the first round of sampling, the maximum measured indoor air concentration should be used for estimating risk and hazard. 
Now, if risk is calculated to be greater than the point of departure, that one times 10 to the minus six or the hazard index is greater than one, you want to manage the exposure. Risk management is discussed more in step four, but it is important if vapor intrusion is identified to go ahead and manage that exposure. Now, if the estimated risk is less than the point of departure, being that one times 10 to the minus six and the hazard index is less than one, then you want to repeat the indoor air sampling event in different seasons, making sure there are two plus indoor air sampling events, including the HVAC on and off scenarios conducted when feasible to confirm the building is a low priority building for current vapor intrusion. If there are multiple contaminants of concern, it is important to assess that cumulative risk as well. Even if the indoor air concentrations are low, estimating potential future risk using the subsurface data is important because changes to the site or building conditions over time may increase vapor intrusion and the indoor air concentrations. Next, I want to cover step 3E, which is evaluating temporal variability. This step is just repeating step 3C, but the goal of step 3E is to understand the variability of indoor air concentrations over different seasons, meteorological, and ventilation conditions. To help demonstrate the wide range in temporal variability in indoor air, this graph that was also shown earlier in this training in the vapor intrusion basics section shows the TCE concentrations from roughly 8,000 samples that were collected at the Sun Devil Manor residence. And these samples were collected over a two and a half plus year period under natural conditions. The data shows significant concentration variations between seasons but also in a single day. Additionally, there was much greater concentration variations during the winter months versus those observed during the spring months. Now, we have stated it is important to evaluate HVAC on and off conditions, but as noted, the HVAC off sampling should only be conducted when it is safe and feasible to do so. Now, if the conceptual site model is robust and supported by multiple lines of evidence, two sampling events, including that HVAC assessment, may be sufficient to evaluate that temporal variability. But to make this decision, there are conditions that really should be met. This includes the indoor air sampling events were conducted in different seasons the subsurface vapor forming chemicals are either not detected in indoor air samples or the cumulative risk and hazard associated with those detected concentrations are consistently below the points of departure, those risk threshold values. And there are no other indications of vapor intrusion, such as elevated concentrations detected in pathway samples. Additionally, the subsurface data demonstrates that contaminant concentrations are stable or decreasing across multiple sampling events. Now, if those conditions are not met, additional sampling events should be conducted to further evaluate that temporal variability to ensure that there are those supporting lines of evidence that the building was sufficiently evaluated. The final step is step 3F, determining those next steps. The next steps that should be based on all available lines of evidence. When you are looking at your current vapor intrusion risk, you want to estimate risk and hazard using those indoor air concentrations. Now this is that final step and you have collected, you know, your multiple indoor air samples, they have been collected in different seasons. You have had HVAC on and off sampling scenarios. And if your risk is less than one times 10 to the minus six, and your hazard index is less than one, the building would be considered a low vapor intrusion priority building. And you would want to reevaluate it in the future if conditions change. 
And those conditions and that kind of scenario of changing conditions is discussed further in step 4B.1. Now, if your risk is greater than 10 to the minus 6 or your hazard index is greater than 1, you want to manage those exposures, and managing the exposure is discussed in further detail in step four, and that is going to be talked on next. Now, another scenario would be that future building, the one that doesn't exist or is going to be demoed and rebuilt and for those future occupants. Now, in that case, you want to evaluate your subsurface lines of evidence to determine that potential vapor intrusion risk. So in that scenario, again, if your risk from the subsurface samples are less than one times 10 to the minus six, and your hazard index is less than one, it would be considered a low future vapor intrusion priority building. Again, that is after a couple of sampling events you don't want to make that determination based on one sampling event. If risk is greater than one times 10 to the minus six, or your hazard index is greater than one, you are going to want to look to manage that exposure. And what and how to manage that exposure, that again is step four and is discussed further and will look different for each site given those site-specific considerations. And that concludes step three. Hi, I'm Nicole Fry from the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, and I'm going to walk you through step four. This step discusses risk evaluation and risk management decisions. Step four contains these four sections. The first section is a new addition since the 2020 draft. It was added in response to public comments that site-specific information is needed to inform risk management decisions. So this section provides considerations for refining the initial risk assessment with site-specific information to support that final risk management decision. We also decided to separate the future risk discussion into existing building and future building, as you'll see in step 4C and 4D. This was in response to many public comments asking for more information about future buildings and how to manage the risk there. And so hopefully um, this will highlight where to go for that information. Another big change was that we removed this risk management table in the final draft. This was in response to public concerns that the guidance should not re recommend specific response actions based solely on a risk and hazard values since there are many lines of evidence that go into such risk management decisions. In addition, a lines of evidence um, attachment was added to the guidance to help describe all of the information that should be considered when making risk management decisions. Ross will be discussing this attachment next. One of the main goals of this guidance is to provide a process for evaluating VI risk. The guidance stresses the need to assess the risk at each building located near site contamination. In the example shown here, there are seven buildings that each have to be evaluated for VI risk. Steps one through three discuss the process for initial VI screening, while step four discusses how the initial screening assessment can be refined for a building once sufficient site-specific information has been collected. Step four does not replace this initial screening. There will be situations where you'll need to make an initial risk management decision using the initial screening evaluation. And then as more data is collected, step four can be used to refine that assessment and make the final risk management decision. Therefore, step four is des designed to occur after initial screening. There are two types of VI risk that we need to assess. First, there's current risk, which considers what people are currently breathing, and current risk is calculated primarily using indoor air data. We also have to assess future VI risk, which considers future changes that could increase vapor intrusion, like changes to the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning operation of a building, remodeling, or potentially new cracks and damage to the building over time. Primarily, future risk is calculated using subsurface VFC concentrations in soil gas or subslab data. This slide provides an overview of the different VI risk assessment refinements. For refining current risk assessments, 
You can use building specific exposure parameters based on the current building occupants, and you can use average indoor air vapor forming chemical concentrations. For refining future risk assessments, you can use average subsurface or soil gas vapor forming chemical concentrations, and you can use building specific attenuation factors based on site specific information about the building. I'm now going to go through an example to explain what we mean by using building specific exposure parameters to refine current risk assessments. So for initial screening, we typically use a generic indoor air exposure time period as shown here. So for commercial worker, we assume eight hours a day, five days a week, 250 days a year, up to 25 years of exposure. And so after the initial screening, once we've collected more site-specific information, in this example, we have a storage building where we know the occupants of the building are only expected to be in the building two hours a day, five days a week, 250 days a year for up to 25 years. And so in step four, we can use this information to refine that current risk. Now I'm gonna go over some of the considerations for averaging sampling data for current or future risk assessments. When we're talking about averaging, we're talking about 95% upper confidence limit on the arithmetic mean. So for this type of calculation, you really do need a sufficient number of sampling events if we're averaging over time, or a sufficient number of sampling locations if we're averaging over space. And just as a reminder for those initial screening assessments, we're not gonna have a sufficient number, so we're gonna use the maximum concentration to get that initial screening evaluation. And then as we collect more data, we can use step four to refine that risk. I'm now gonna go through some of the, the things that we don't recommend doing when averaging data. So first, we um, don't recommend averaging sampling events with increasing vapor forming chemical concentrations. This is particularly important for um, thinking about future risk. Second, we don't um, recommend averaging sampling locations over large areas, specifically large areas with different HVAC zones, different uh, multiple exposure areas, hot spots and outliers, and or multiple sampling depths and heights. Third, we don't recommend sampling, um, averaging sampling locations or events if there's a short-term exposure concern, such as you know, TCE above a short, term exposure level. Now I'm gonna give go through this example, looking at indoor air data and deciding whether we should average um, this data or not. So here we have a multi-unit building. There's two units with two exposure areas, um, two different HVAC zones. And in addition, we have um, higher concentrations on the right unit versus the left unit. And so, for this example, um, it's pretty clear that we don't want to average because we have the different HVAC zones, the different exposure units, and the, the kind of the hotspot area. Okay, now let's go over how to select a potential future subslab to indoor air attenuation factor that can be used to refine the risk assessment for an existing building. So first, we're going to calculate the empirical subslab to indoor air attenuation factor. We're going to want to use indoor air and subslab data that is paired. And ideally, you're going to want to have enough data collected throughout the building to get a sense of the spatial variability and collected over time to get a sense of temporal variability. Um, and then it's going to be a really site specific decision whether or not you're going to average the data in any way. But ultimately, you're going to divide the indoor air concentration divided by the subslab soil gas concentration to get that empirical attenuation factor. And for an example, we're just going to use 0.0008 um, for our empirical attenuation factor. So next, we're going to select a potential future attenuation factor. And so this value needs to be greater than our empirical measured attenuation factor to account for changes to the building over time. And typically you're going to select this value from a range of values that are observed in an applicable VI database um, study. 
And so in this example, we're selecting 0 0.003 as the potential future attenuation factor. It's the 50th percentile of the US EPA VI database. And you can see that this value is greater than our measured value. Now we're going to go over how to select the potential future soil gas to indoor air attenuation factor. Again, this is for an existing building. So first, we're going to start with um, our potential future subslab to indoor air attenuation factor. You're either going to select the 0 0.03 screening attenuation factor or a justified value, um, as we discussed on the previous slide. And again, we're 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 choosing these values to to account for changes to the building over time. Um, and then next, we want to look at the empirical soil gas to subslab attenuation factor. So for initial screening, we assume that there's no attenuation below the building. Um, but as you'll see when you collect the data at your site, you might have some attenuation. And so to, to get a sense of that, you can calculate the soil gas to subslab attenuation factor by dividing the subslab concentration by the soil gas concentration. And now with these two attenuation factors, you essentially multiply them together and you can get this potential future soil gas to indoor air attenuation factor that accounts for the actual measured attenuation below the building while also using a conservative subslab to indoor air attenuation factor that is accounting for potential changes to the building over time. Now let's look at using modeling to predict the potential future soil gas to indoor air attenuation factor. You can do this for an existing building where it's infeasible to collect that subslab data, or you can do it at a future building that hasn't been built yet. And so in this modeling, we first wanna account for a potential future attenuation factor that accounts for changes to the building. And so one ex example of how you do this is using US EPA's modeling tool based on Johnson & Ettinger modeling. And in their model, you can input a Q soil over Q building value. And so Q soil is the vapor entry rate, Q building is the building ventilation rate. And so this ratio essentially equals the subslab to indoor air attenuation factor. And so you can either put in the um, screening attenuation factor of 0.03 or a justified value that's based on multiple lines of evidence um, about specifically about that building. And next in the, in the model, you're going to want to put in your site-specific subsurface condition values so that the model can account for any um, and predict the attenuation from the soil gas to subslab. Ultimately, as much as you can, you're gonna to wanna to use sampling data to verify the model's predictions um, as appropriate. Once the risk has been assessed, now the VI risk needs to be managed. So the guidance provides considerations for the following six risk management options. For a given site, you'll most likely be using more than one of these options to manage the, the risk at all of the potentially impacted buildings at the site. So on the next few slides, I'll go over each of these risk management options. So the first risk management option is to designate a building as low priority for VI risk. So I'm gonna go through some of the considerations for making that decision. First, let's look at the two different types of low priority buildings. First, you could have a building where indoor air demonstrates there's a low current VI risk, whereas the subsurface data shows there's a potential future VI risk. So in, for that building, you'd have no action for current VI risk unless conditions changed at the building. And then you would also be selecting a different risk management option to address that future risk. The second type is basically where we have low risk for both current and future VI risk. And so in that case, you'd have no action to address either current or future risk unless conditions change. And so when we have these low priority buildings, we're definitely going to want to make sure we're monitoring for changes in conditions throughout the cleanup process. 
So some of the ways you can do this are using building surveys to identify changes that could increase VI risk at the buildings. So this could be, you know, remodeling that happens or changes in HVAC system. You're also going to want to use um, site, site-wide soil gas monitoring data, and you can use this to reassess the risk when site conditions change. So if that site-wide soil gas data indicates that the contamination is migrating towards that low priority building, you're either going to want to collect soil gas sample close to the building or just go directly to indoor air and get the data to reassess that VI risk for the building. However, you know, you might find over time that the site-wide soil gas monitoring shows that there's no future migration of that contamination towards the building. And so in that case, you would decide that there's no further reassessment of VI risk at that building. And you'd want to have that determination for, for all the buildings before you get, you get closure for the site. Okay, now I'm going to go over some considerations for the monitoring only response action. And so this could be monitoring of indoor air for assessing current risk and um, sub slab and or soil gas sampling at the building for assessing future risk. So in general, we're going to use monitoring to reduce the exposure uncertainties as well as potentially um, to justify the protectiveness of the selected potential future um, attenuation factors for that building. In general, you're only going to want to use the monitoring only response action um, if the other risk management options are not warranted and or feasible. So when selecting the monitoring frequency, we want to consider the potential changes that could increase VI risk. So we're, we're capturing that in our monitoring. So first, you want to think about the seasonal temperature and barometric pressure changes that are expected in the area of your building. You want to think about how often is that water table fluctuating? Are there going to be changes in the soil moisture around the building? Are there going to be modifications to the building or the ventilation system and or the HVAC system? And then also, is groundwater or soil gas plume migrating and um, or is it stable? OK, now let's go over some considerations for VI mitigation. So if you have an existing building where there is a current indoor air exposure, you're definitely going to want to use whatever feasible mitigation options you have to reduce that indoor air exposure. At a potential future building, you're going to want to use multiple lines of evidence to make a site-specific decision about whether or not to install a VA mitigation system at that future building. You're going to want to be able to tailor the mitigation approach based on the level of expected exposure. So this could be based on the nature of the contaminant. Um, the magnitude of the contamination, and also the duration of expected exposure for those building occupants. You're also going to want to be able to adjust the mitigation approach as needed. Um, there could be times where you try a certain approach and it doesn't work and you need to make iterative changes until you get sufficient reduction in exposure. And lastly, just remember, mitigation should not be seen as a substitute for remediation. OK, here are the interim remedial action considerations. So we can use interim remedial action to address current risk and expedite um, the reduction of high indoor air exposures. And so some examples of how we can do this to address VI risk, we could do some excavation of a release area to reduce contamination. We could also do soil vapor extraction near or below a building. We could also use groundwater pumping to restrict the plume migration below down gradient buildings. OK, here are the remedial action considerations. So in general, we want to implement timely cleanup to reduce mitigation and or mitigation timeframes. We also want to make remedial action decisions based on the results of site-wide investigation, including characterization of the risk, 
and the technologies available to achieve the site-based cleanup goals. We want to select remedial action objectives or cleanup goals based on site-specific information, such as the justified building-specific attenuation factor, as we discussed previously. Okay, lastly, let's go over the considerations for institutional controls used as the risk management option to address either current or future VI risk. So in the case of current VI risk, institutional controls can be used when mitigation is not effective or feasible at addressing a current indoor air exposure. In the case of future VI risk, institutional controls can be used when remedial action objectives are not protective of all reasonably foreseeable future uses of the property. So some examples for institutional controls that address current VI risk. We can have temporary building use changes to reduce the occupancy time at the building. We can also um, do relocation of building occupants. Typically, this is only done if there's an acute or short-term exposure scenario. And just keep in mind that a site-specific risk assessment will be needed to justify the protectiveness of building use changes implemented using institutional controls. And some examples for future VI risk. So we can use land use covenants restricting building or land uses. So for example, we can restrict residential or school use at the property. We can limit building occupancy or potentially prohibit activities that are inconsistent with a site-specific risk, uh, risk management plan for the, case, for the site. Okay, in conclusion, we've gone over how to use step four to evaluate and manage the VI risk at every building near site contamination. Hello everyone, my name is Ross Steenson with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board. And in this segment, we're gonna cover attachments one through four of the Supplemental Vapor Intrusion Guidance or SVIG. The four attachments are in order. Number one, lines of evidence. Number two, petroleum specific considerations. Number three, sewers and other vapor conduits as preferential pathways for vapor intrusion. And number four, groundwater as a line of evidence to evaluate vapor intrusion risk. Attachment one, the lines of evidence attachment, covers the following. It defines what a line of evidence or LOE is. It discusses the weighting of a line of evidence and weighing or integrating multiple lines of evidence. It also provides a description of the typical lines of evidence used in developing conceptual site models, along with some discussion of some more recent, less frequently used testing methods. This attachment is new and it was added in response to comments on the February 2020 draft SVIG. A line of evidence is a fact or other information determined by any of the following. Direct observation, such as a building survey, uh, interviews with knowledgeable persons, review of records and documents such as aerial photos, phase one environmental assessments, or other reports, the sampling and analysis of environmental media, such as indoor air, outdoor air, soil gas, results of research and testing, or um, a statistical or other type of analysis, such as uh, empirical databases. Each of these is referred to as its own line of evidence, and it's important to keep in mind that these can be uh, either qualitative or quantitative. The benefits of using multiple lines of evidence is that it results in uh, an improved understanding of vapor intrusion at our site. It increases confidence in our decision making regarding the VI pathway, and it reduces the overall uncertainty particularly when some lines of evidence may have significant uncertainty. The classic situation where we need multiple lines of evidence for VI is the interpretation of indoor air results, where we can have indoor air data, outdoor air data, the building survey results, subslab or uh, other uh, subsurface type of data or crawl space air data, site history, um, we may additionally have utility location information and uh, vapor conduit air data, and all of these have to be weighted uh, and weighed 
to interpret whether VI is occurring at a given site or building. When using multiple lines of evidence, one of the things you're going to have to do is, is figure out how much weight or importance you're going to assign to a given line of evidence. To think about this, we're going to walk you through three factors, with the first being relevance. That gets at how much does the line of evidence help you address the question being asked. To speak to this, I'm going to use this cross section down below. Let me explain it to you. So on the right, we have a dry cleaner. There's been a release of PCE, uh, and it's contaminated the underlying soil, and it's reached groundwater, and it's flowing. We have a groundwater plume flowing off to the left into a neighborhood with residences. So question might be, how relevant are the groundwater data for evaluating the VI pathway? And the answer is, it depends. So for the dry cleaner building, uh, it's not so helpful or relevant because there's overlying soil contamination. In that situation, indoor air and subslab soil gas are going to be more relevant lines of evidence. Essentially, from an SBIG perspective, you'd be starting with step three. Moving off to the left into the neighborhood, the groundwater data become a more relevant line of evidence because it's the local vapor source. You don't have the overlying soil contamination, right? So next factor I'd like to mention is representativeness. And this gets at whether the information accurately replicates site conditions or the question being asked. So let's take indoor air sampling. Would sampling in a bathroom only be um, indicative of long-term risk to occupants? And the answer is probably not unless they spend most of their time in the bathroom. So generally what we're, you know, we might sample in a bathroom to evaluate whether VI is occurring or the vapors are entering it in the bathroom. But we, when it comes to evaluating long-term risk or chronic risk, we generally want to collect samples in the most routinely occupied spaces. Third uh, factor is quality. And this is whether the sampling or analysis was performed in, using an accepted protocol. So uh, an example might be were the soil gas samples collected in accordance with the active soil gas advisory and did the, the quality control checkout. Key thing to keep in mind is that the same line of evidence could be weighted differently at a different site or a different building at the same site or even for the same building if the situation is different. For instance, maybe the HVAC is operating versus not, right? Um, or even separate sampling events. So when weighting a line of evidence, context is critical. So after you have um, weighted individual lines of evidence, uh, you have to weigh or integrate those lines of evidence uh, together to make an interpretation. Right? And it's important to keep in mind that um, not all lines of evidence are likely to agree. If line of evidence or lines of evidence don't agree, you shouldn't automatically dismiss them. You should try to explain them why they're not in agreement. And as you add lines of evidence, the conceptual site model should be updated. The lines of evidence attachment describes a number of LOEs and we've grouped them into the following categories. Site characteristics, which includes uh, aspects of the site history, the building condition, subsurface conditions, the site characterization, LOE, which is really the, you know, the soil gas and the groundwater data, indoor air data. Contamination characteristics, you know, is the source a dilute solution or was it actually non-aqueous phase liquid that was released? Uh, contaminant properties. Weather meteorological conditions. And then we cover a number of other um, LOEs, such as models, the use of models, and other measurement techniques. On this and the coming slides, I'm going to go over some of the categories and individual lines of evidence. Here we have building characteristics. And this is one of the factors that makes um, evaluating the vapor intrusion pathway challenging. And so we think about the design and construction, and we can make some general characteriz uh, characterizations about susceptibility 
So on the chart on the right, we have at the bottom, we have the dirt floor basement listed as being the most susceptible to vapor intrusion. This is because it has um, a lot, you know, a lot of surface area in contact with the soil, and part of it is unpaved, uh, allowing potentially higher soil vapor entry rates. Kind of stepping up from that, we have slab on grade, which only has the slab in contact with the soil. Crawl space is offset from the soil, and so there is some space for potential dilution. Uh, I have to consider how open that space is, how well ventilated that space, and whether um, there may be fresh air intakes in that space. Subterranean garages, on the one hand, have a lot of surface area in contact with the soil. They're, of course, concreted, um, and they also, but they also have uh, ventilation, at least to prevent carbon monoxide buildup, which should help alleviate potential vapor intrusion to some extent. Open air garages are considered the least susceptible because they have um, quite a bit of height uh, uh, between the soil and the in occupied spaces above, uh, and so there's plenty of room for air dispersion and movement. Another factor to think, um, that may affect is where the entry points, uh, vapor entry points and pathways such as elevator shafts or sumps. The condition of the building is really important. So um, buildings that have been damaged may be more susceptible. Buildings that have been renovated and potentially maybe the floor hasn't been put back um, in the spaces behind the walls, that may um, increase the susceptibility to vapor intrusion. And lastly, there's ventilation. And this gets at you know, how the windows and doors are used, whether there's an HVAC system and how it's operated, uh, and whether there are exhaust fans that locally could in, um, depressurize and induce vapor intrusion. So all these things uh, have to be, can be factored in um, or have to be thought about whether a building is susceptible to vapor intrusion or not. So next, let's cover the subsurface conditions line of evidence. Here we're going to break this into geology and stratigraphy first. And so what we're thinking about are soil types and their characteristics. So for soil types, we're thinking whether it's coarse or fine grained. And then in terms of characteristics, let's kind of focus on moisture content here because that is the dominant control on vapor transport in the subsurface. So at higher moisture contents, vapors diffuse more slowly and it basically attenuate more uh, sharply in, through those soils, leading to reduced potential for vapor intrusion. This is particularly true for the finer grain soils because they have the ability to hold, a, uh, in general, greater uh, water content at field conditions than coarser grain units. In terms of continuity, so if we have continuous fine grain layers, considering their char characteristics of generally having higher moisture contents, that's going to lead to reduced potential for vapor intrusion or vapor migration. If those layers are not continuous, then potentially the vapors are going to be able to move around those layers. And so that's the, the key thing in terms of continuity. You may recall that for the groundwater screening attenuation factor from US EPA, there's an alternative uh, for a lower, slightly lower attenuation factor when there are continuous fine grain layers. In terms of anthropogenic influences, here we've just listed a few and they have kind of different potential effects. So grading, filling, utility trenches, these things are going to change the the vapor, character, the vapor migration characteristics of the subsurface, they may break up the soil structure, break up that continuity. The presence of buildings or hardscape can you know, result to some extent in the capping effect or may result in the capping effect. Um, irrigation is going to introduce more water into the subsurface, so it's going to increase soil moisture and at least locally um, or temporarily result in less vapor migration. In terms of groundwater, we're thinking about what's the water table depth, how much beta zone do we have to work with, what's, what are the range of fluctuations, and it's also important to keep in mind capillary fringe thick thickness, which is partly a function of um, the soil type. So finer grain soils near the water table are going to have a much thicker capper layer fringes, and this is a high moisture zone, again, resulting in less vapor migration, greater attenuation.
And then we have potential preferential pathways. Obviously, there are natural um, preferential pathways such as fractures or gravel layers or gravel backfill. But then we also have vapor conduits. And again, what we're talking about when we say vapor conduits is we're tra talking about essentially unimpeded or nearly unimpeded vapor transport through the airspace of a pipe or a conduit. So for this slide, I just wanted to bring to attention that the lines of evidence attachment discusses all of these contaminant characterization lines of evidence. And so you can consult that on your own time, perhaps as you need to use these for your individual sites. On the coming slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the soil matrix data line of evidence can be used and its limitations. So for the soil matrix data line of evidence, it's not used directly for evaluating the potential for vapor intrusion. For that, we want soil gas or indoor air data primarily. Um, but it can still be helpful as part of the evaluation to identify source areas and or their extent, uh, potentially the presence of NAPL, planning for soil gas sampling. And for situations where you can't get soil gas samples due to low permeability soil or it's locally saturated, uh, supplementing with some soil matrix data could prove helpful. Um, and then there's some other uses, for instance, um, if you need to assess risk for the direct soil exposure pathway. So let's wrap this up with limitations of soil matrix data for evaluating vapor intrusion. Loss of volatiles both before and after the sample collection all the way to the time of analysis is the major issue. And this volatile loss can be significant. As a result, samples should be collected quickly and preserved in accordance with US EPA method 5035. This method, which it originally released by US EPA in 1999, and then DTSC uh, published this 2004 guidance document promoting its use in California. So non-US EPA method 5035 data, which soil data, which primarily includes everything before the DTSC document, should in general should not be heavily weighted as a line of evidence for vapor intrusion evaluations. We still see that some samples, VOC samples today, are not analyzed for 5035, so be sure to keep an eye on that for your own projects. The other major issue is soil matrix heterogeneity. And so soil samples that are collected over you know, just short distances away, uh, centimeters or feet, yards, can have a wide variation in concentration. For further reading on these topics, uh, we point you to this US EPA 2014 engineering issue. So for contamination characteristics, lines of evidence, uh, the three aspects we're going to cover. So first is a source type and strength. So non-aqueous phase liquid or NAPL would be expected to uh, be a high strength source generally, whereas um, what's dissolved in groundwater or uh, in dilute solutions such as uh, NAPL mixed with another solvent like water, diesel, or oil uh, would be kind of a lower uh, so strength uh, source. You know, contamination or contaminant chemical and physical properties can be uh, really important for understanding potential for VI. So, you know, think about volatility and, you know, in that case, we're talking about vapor pressure for volatilization from the actual NAPL or Henry's Law constant for volatilization from the water phase, be it soil moisture or groundwater, um, as well as other factors such as solubility, absorption, etc. Vapor transport mechanisms, remember that diffusion is the dominant vapor transport mechanism in the subsurface and the transport direction is from high concentration to low concentration. And that chemical diffusion through water is occurs at a much lower rate, orders of magnitude lower than diffusion in air, which is why soil moisture has a, a major influence on the potential for uh, vapor intrusion as we mentioned in earlier slides. Advection uh, is where the transport is from high pressure to low pressure. And for the typical situation for VI, this happens only in the immediate vicinity of the building 
where the high, there's higher pressure in the SERP surface and potentially the building itself is depressurized due to the stack effect. So digging a little deeper into contaminant chemical and physical properties. First up, just a reminder that the SFIG uses the same definition as US EPA for that of a volatile chemical in terms of vapor pressure and the Henry's Law constant. Uh, here we have a table of tetrachloroethene, PCE, trichloroethene, TCE, cis-12, dichloroethene, and uh, VC or vinyl chloride. Just wanted to point out a you know, couple of interesting uh, differences. So for taking PCE and TCE, if you look at the compare the vapor pressures, um, TCE has about is about three uh, three times the vapor pressure of TCE, meaning it has kind of a greater propensity to volatilize from the NAPL phase. Um, we have slight reverse situation in terms of the Henry's law constant with PCE about you know twice the propensity to volatilize from groundwater. And then comparing both of those to vinyl chloride, it has a much, much higher uh, vapor pressure and, and Henry's law constant really wants to be in the vapor phase and highly volatile contaminant. Moving on to the weather meteorological condition lines of evidence, just want to touch on a few things. Um, barometric pressure, temperature effects. There's also wind effects, which we're not going to cover. Um, and so on the left, we have the classic illustration of the stack effect. So we have cold air outside, perhaps it's winter, have a building, the building is being heated, warm air rises, warm air is less dense, draws in uh, cool air from the subsurface. So vapor intrusion potentially is kind of on here. Um, and this is why we often uh, want to see a round of sampling, indoor air sampling, uh, during you know the, the cooler seasons. On the right, we have a graph that's taken from one of these continuous monitoring investigations where they've plotted a barometric pressure in the kind of dark gray or in the gray color and TCE concentration in indoor air in a kind of a bluish color. And you can see that um, the TCE spikes correlate with drops in barometric pressure. And these Types of investigations aren't done at every site, but often done when the indoor air results. Um, it's not clear what's going on at a site, and they come in and do this as follow-up work. Mathematical models can also be used as a line of evidence, and here we put together some of the use considerations. So models are best used when you have a well-developed conceptual site model, and also you have site-specific data for key parameters. The use of models in the refined risk assessment is discussed in SVIG Step 4. Some of the considerations when using models as a line of evidence is inc including uncertainty analyses to help understand um, the range of potential outcomes. Uh, in addition, um, using them possibly to support but not be the sole line of evidence in developing cleanup goals. The possibility of collecting confirmation into our air samples uh, to verify results or predictions, or using multi-depth soil gas samples to kind of figure out empirically how much attenuation is actually taking place in the subsurface. Models are generally best not used for initial screening of occupied buildings when you really don't have a lot of information about a site. This is discussed in the SVIG introduction. I've referenced the specific section. When you have non-homogeneous subsurface conditions, um, for instance, the geology is, is very complex. When preferential pathways are not ruled out, when sources are shallow, right? and um, when conditions are changing, such as plumes are migrating. So over the last decade or more, there have been a number of newer testing methods that have been suggested that are promising in, um, in evaluating the vapor intrusion pathway. We've uh, pro provided descriptions of a number of these in the uh, lines of evidence attachment, along with some considerations for their use. Um, for instance, indicators, tracers, and surrogates, 
um, continuous monitoring where samples are collected very frequently over a few day campaign. They might include indoor air, sub slab, um, barometric pressure, um, temperature measurements, and some of these other methods. Some of the things to keep in mind are, you know, most of these methods are not verified by US EPA or Cal EPA. So it's going to be um, in incumbent for the regulators to have a work plan to be able to review. Um, and they're probably going to have to consult their colleagues that may or may not be familiar with this. Um, and so these, you know, these methods are best used as an another line of evidence. And uh, be aware that acceptance can vary among stakeholders and might you require um, a fair bit of communication if this line of evidence or these lines of evidence are being heavily weighted. So in terms of these other lines of evidence, one line of evidence uh, we get a lot of questions about, and that's radon. Um, you know, is it, can it be used essentially as a surrogate for, VF, for VOCs or VFCs, and especially to determine site-specific attenuation factors? So on the plus side, uh, it's a gaseous product that does not, um, you know, it's not reactive and it can be measured in the laboratory, but also with some field instruments. Um, however, in terms of contrast versus volatile organic chemicals, uh, the source and distribution differ. You know, radon is more widely distributed and versus the VOC sources. Um, the, the transport mechanism from soil gas to indoor air is generally similar, uh, but there are some differences in characteristics. This slide points out a couple of uses for radon as a line of evidence. So one is evaluating building susceptibility to VI. And in this situation, you would uh, measure indoor air radon and soil gas radon at multiple buildings uh, to see whether radon concentrations are higher in certain buildings, and you could go prioritize those for VFC indoor air sampling. Another option is to see if you can to monitor radon and VFCs and soil gas and indoor air over time, um, see if there's a correlation. Can you know Is radon a good indicator uh, when it increases whether um, VFCs are increasing? And then you could use radon uh, in an ongoing manner um, to determine when to sample uh, VFCs and indoor air, when VI is occurring. Lastly, limitations. So radon is not considered a good surrogate for VFCs. So the changes in radon concentrations typically are not proportional to changes in VFC concentrations, so we would not necessarily use radon attenuation factors as a, as a um, exact uh, match for VFC attenuation factors. Now, if you conducted this um, evaluation above where you monitored radon and VFCs and soil gas and indoor air over time, and you found those attenuation factors you know, at multiple locations over time, and you found those to match, that might mean that for your that particular site or that particular building, maybe it is a good surrogate, but just in general, it's not. Okay, folks, let's wrap up attachment one lines of evidence with Jessica's and Nicole's tricolor diagram. Let me explain how this is set up. Down the middle, we have lines of evidence or selection of lines of evidence. On the right, we have kind of two different considerations. One is high VI potential or high uncertainty, not the same thing. So keep in mind, if what you read doesn't match one, it probably matches the other, right? Uh, and on the left, low VI potential or low uncertainty. So I'm not going to go through every one of these, but let's pick a few. Um, environmental persistence. So chemicals that are not persistent or have low persistence are going to, in general, have lower VI potential, right? Um, chemicals that have that are persistent are going to have a greater VI potential. So our classic examples for the right would be chlorinated VFCs, and on the left would be uh, petroleum VFCs. Let's take uh, proximity to contaminated media. So um, there's going to be higher VI potential uh, if the contaminated media is closer to a building, you know, vertically or laterally, than if it's far away. 
let's take modeling. So, you know, if there's no empirical data, we're just kind of using a generic model and some generic soil layers, and we don't have, you know, good cross sections to match that up. It's going to be greater uncertainty associated with that than for a situation where we've got good control on the geology, the soil layers, uh, soil parameters, and we have, you know, essentially as many uh, inputs as we can controlled, right? And then lastly, let's take uh, offsite source contamination. So if you have an offsite source, um, you know, if that source is not controlled and potentially it's feeding a groundwater plume that's coming onto your site, you're going to have greater uncertainty and probably greater VI potential than you would otherwise, right? So that wraps up lines of evidence. Attachment 2 presents the petroleum-specific considerations when using the supplemental VI guidance. The attachment covers the following. The objectives, background on petroleum hydrocarbon biodegradation, description of two different PVI or petroleum vapor intrusion screening approaches, and the use of these approaches in steps 1 through 4 for non-UST petroleum sites. This attachment was significantly revised in response to comments on the draft SVIG. The primary objective of Attachment 2 is to promote approaches to petroleum vapor intrusion screening at non-underground storage tank petroleum release sites that are similar to the approaches in the State Water Board's Low Threat UST Case Closure Policy. The second objective is to describe how to use these PVI screening approaches in conjunction with the SVIG. This slide serves as a comparison and contrast between petroleum vapor intrusion and chlorinated vapor intrusion. We have identical release scenarios, uh, one on the left for uh, petroleum VFCs released from an underground storage tank, and on the right, uh, release of chlorinated VFCs from an underground storage tank. However, there's some distinct differences. So you can see on the left that uh, NAPL non-aqueous phase liquid has traveled or migrated through the VEDO zone and pooled on top of the groundwater, and so we have LNAPL. They're both vapor phase and dissolved phase hydrocarbon plumes, but their extent is relatively limited as compared to the chlorinated VFC release on the right. And this is due to biodegradation. So petroleum hydrocarbons are susceptible to biodegradation, and this serves to slow and limit the migration of petroleum hydrocarbons in both soil vapor and groundwater. So let's cover a little bit more regarding biodegradation. As I said on the previous slide, hydrocarbons are susceptible to biodegradation, um, particularly the smaller and more mobile hydrocarbons the volatile and soluble hydrocarbons being the most susceptible. The degree of susceptibility varies based on chemical structure, uh, and particularly branching results in slower biodegradation. And typically, there are residuals. So not all hydrocarbons degrade in a timely fashion into carbon dioxide and water. There are a wide range of conditions that are suitable for biodegradation in soils by naturally occurring microbes. Typically, uh, under aerobic conditions, biodegradation proceeds rapidly. Something to keep in mind when we're thinking about soil vapor and vapor intrusion is that the biodegradation occurs in the water phase, so that's soil moisture and groundwater, not in the air or vapor phase. This slide serves as a reminder that for petroleum underground storage tanks, Releases from those sites must be evaluated for vapor intrusion in accordance with the State Water Resources Control Board's low threat UST case closure policy rather than the SVIG. The technical basis for the approaches to petroleum vapor intrusion in the policy are described in this document entitled Technical Justification for Vapor Intrusion Media Specific Criteria. And this is a good resource on petroleum biodegradation and how that serves to limit the migration of vapors in the subsurface. Next up, let's talk about the two PVI screening approaches. So first, we have the separation distance approach. This relies on the potential for aerobic biodegradation, and it requires the presence of clean soil 
between the subsurface impacted media and the building in question. And it primarily uses uh, soil and groundwater data in conjunction with empirically determined distances based on source type and strength. And there are two of those. So first, we have um, non-aqueous phase liquid, or NAPL, and that separation distance is 30 feet. For dissolved uh, sources, we have uh, two separation distances, either five or 10 feet, based on the groundwater concentration, the strength, source strength, and the presence of oxygen. The other approach is called the soil gas oxygen approach, and it relies also on the potential for aerobic biodegradation. Similarly, it requires clean soil between the uh, impacted media and receptor, and it primarily uses soil gas data where the soil gas samples are analyzed both for petroleum hydrocarbons as well as fixed gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and methane. Then the oxygen levels in soil gas are used to select a bioattenuation factor, or BAF, that is used in conjunction with the base attenuation factor. For situations where oxygen is less than 1%, basically get no bioattenuation adjustment, so a BAF of 1. At 1% 1 oxygen, you, use a bio, you can use a bioattenuation factor of 0.1. So in this situation where you're using a soil gas uh, attenuation factor of 0.03, that could be adjusted to be 0 0.003. And then at 4%, you get a BAF of 0.001. It's important to note that the BAF is not applied to subslab soil gas because biodegradation does not occur in the air or vapor phase. This slide presents a couple of uh, separation distance uh, cross sections for NAPL sources. And these diagrams were borrowed from the low threat UST case closure policy appendices. So on the left, we have a residence surface uh, and we have an uh, L NAPL mobile NAPL uh, on the groundwater table. And there is at least 30 feet of clean soil defined as total petroleum hydrocarbons or TPH less than 100 milligrams per kilogram between the source and the building foundation. And so this distance is uh, considered or has been demonstrated through numerous empirical studies, experience at petroleum UST sites supported by modeling, but again, primarily empirical, that this is sufficient distance to attenuate petroleum hydrocarbon vapors in the subsurface. On the right, we have a similar diagram, except in this case, we are looking at residual or non-mobile El Napel bound up in the soil, and there's at least 30 feet uh, distance between the subsurface source and the building foundation. Something that's important to keep in mind is when we're using the SVIG for screening at petroleum-only sites, and specifically non-UST petroleum-only sites, is that um, in the step 1B.1 for building prioritization, you can substitute the 30-foot NAPL separation distance uh, for the 100-foot distance um, that's mentioned for really for chlorinated uh, releases. So now I'd like to describe our second PVI screening approach, which we call the soil gas oxygen screening approach. And to do that, I'm going to walk you through this conceptual PVI cross section from US EPA to give you an idea how this uh, biodegradation uh, acts on the petroleum vapors to uh, reduce concentrations. So this diagram is set up with uh, increasing depth on the y-axis on the left. So you have the land surface at the top, and then you have your impact to media at the bottom. And then on the x-axis, we have increasing concentration to the right that is used for these three different curves that are plotted. So let's start with the solid red curve, which is labeled PHCs and uh, or petroleum hydrocarbons and CH4 methane. And so you can see just above the impacted soil, we have very high concentrations in the vapor phase. Um, throughout this kind of reddish re reaction zone, those concentrations drop sharply. Typically, in, in practice, this is uh, orders of magnitude decreases over uh, short distances, say a few feet. 
to the point where the concentrations of hydrocarbons that essentially that are are non-detect by the time um, uh, it reaches the land surface. On the right, we have this oxygen curve as a dash blue curve, and you can see, as expected, it, concentrations of oxygen would be relatively high near the land surface and then decrease through the Vado zone and then sharply dropping um, through the reaction zone as the microbes use the oxygen in breaking down the hydrocarbons in the moisture phase. The dot dash green curve is for CO2 or carbon dioxide, and that's roughly kind of a mirror image of the oxygen curve. You can kind of think of that as a quality control check, perhaps. So in this approach, what you're really doing is you're investigating the extent of hydrocarbons in the soil vapor. And it's common to see the use of vertical soil gas profiles to kind of demonstrate that this, this type of breakdown is occurring or attenuation is occurring. So you're additionally analyzing the soil gas samples for fixed gases, um, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and methane, you know, in addition to the petroleum hydrocarbons. And then if there's sufficient oxygen present, then you can uh, employ the appropriate bioattenuation factor. Wanted to give you an example of a, a real site. And so here we have a vertical soil gas profile uh, at a um, crude oil pipeline release site where the, the crude oil had been mixed with a pressure distillate and had a high aromatic content. The LNAPL had, had spread uh, down gradient and was uh, actually beneath this crawl space home. The consultants went out and did multiple uh, soil gas probe locations and collected samples at uh, three depths at each location. And I've just selected a few of the constituents they analyzed for, which included uh, TPH gas, which would represent the bulk hydrocarbon vapors, uh, benzene, and oxygen. And so you can see um, just above the water table and the LNAPL, which I haven't really drawn in here, we have about 24 million micrograms per cubic meter of TPH gasoline. This is a fairly typical near source vapor concentration. Uh, within two and a half feet, we lose three orders of magnitude of uh, concentration. So significant reduction over a very short distance. Benzene goes from you know, near 80,000 micrograms per cubic meter at seven and a half feet to non-detect with a slightly elevated reporting limit at five feet. And then you can see, not a big surprise, oxygen is high in the Vado zone, but um, in the reaction zone down here at seven and a half feet, it's just 3%. And so this is a fairly typical example, but again, you can um, conduct this type of sampling at your own sites to see if this degree of attenuation of hydrocarbon vapors is occurring. So let's wrap up attachment to petroleum specific considerations. And I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts on this. One is when should we be most concerned about PVI? And one situation is when the subsurface source is close to the building, right? Another situation is if you've had large scale releases of petroleum products and you have significant NAPL, significant you know, source and strength. So it's not necessarily the site type, but the nature of the release that drives that uh, potential for PVI. Wanted to point out that uh, for evaluating uh, VI for mixed chlorinated and petroleum releases. It's uh, generally should treat them uh, as a chlorinated release initially, or at least during the initial screening steps one through three. And then you reevaluate re that during step four, the refined risk assessment. Attachment three is entitled Sewers and Other Vapor Conduits as Preferential Pathways for Vapor Intrusion. This attachment is mainly focused on sewers and provides an overview on sewers, it summarizes some studies demonstrating sewer or vapor conduit vapor intrusion, it talks about how to collect sewer and vapor conduit air samples, and it also discusses uh, approaches for evaluating sewer air. This cross-section presents a conceptual model for the sewer air and actually the vapor conduit VI pathway. So we have a, a residence with a basement, and you can see we have two different types of uh, utilities. So on the left and on the kind of 
central bottom portion of the picture, we have uh, the sewer in green. And then on the right hand side, we have a land drain in purple. This land drain was uh, designed to direct water and moisture away from the building. Here at the lower right, we have a VFC groundwater plume that is in contact with the pipes. And so VFCs, the groundwater contaminated with VFCs is able to enter the pipes and then the VFCs are able to directly volatilize into the airspace within these pipes and then travel along the pipes and either get closer to the building to be released or potentially be released inside the building. Uh, for instance, a you know faulty seals, uh, peat traps, or damaged pipes, or via the floor drain, or potentially uh, a break in the pipe, and then the vapors come in through the normal soil vapor intrusion pathway. So one of the key things to keep in mind here is that we're talking about transport through the airspace, not through backfill around these pipes. So as I mentioned on the opening slide, attachment three includes a description of sewers and uh, a summary of studies uh, where sewer VI or vapor conduit VI have been demonstrated. We recommend that you review these when you have time. Um, for the next couple of slides, we're just going to talk about screening of vapors in sewer air and also sampling. So uh, in 2018, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program uh, published three documents related to the sewer air vapor conduit VI pathway and included a protocol for evaluating the threat. Uh, and this, this uh, protocol is pretty helpful. So it starts with a desktop screening, which includes uh, collecting and, and reviewing maps and drawings, identifying the locations and depths of sewers and utility conduits near release areas or groundwater plumes. For situations where those two intersect, or wh where those intersect, that represents a greater threat for this pathway to be active. Based on that, if if your site works out to be a lower threat, you could start with a conventional VI investigation approach, which would essentially, for the SVIG, be step two, soil gas. For greater threats, um, this would recommend additionally sampling sewer conduit air. However, in the context of the SVIG for greater threats, you would actually proceed to sampling indoor air via step three, and you would you would consider whether or not to sample sewer vapor conduit air from the get-go, or perhaps you would include that at a later step if the initial round of indoor air results were difficult to interpret. So this sketch illustrates some potential sewer air sample locations. So there are manholes, um, cleanouts, and vents. I think from a practical standpoint or an easy at physical access standpoint, cleanouts and manholes would be the best. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you would probably have to obtain uh, access permission uh, before sampling it at any of these locations. So let's wrap up attachment three with some examples of options for sampling sewer air. So at the top left, we have sampling from a manhole. And in this particular uh, drawing, a sumer canister is deployed at the surface and then a long tube is with a weight is placed down uh, to just above the liquid level and that's how the sample is collected. Another option might be to suspend a, a passive sampler um, uh, to, to get this uh, type of sample. On the right, we have uh, sampling from a lateral or clean out, again with a suma canister and a tube uh, running down the, the clean out. And then um, over at the lower left, we have an example where a uh, essentially a tube with uh, some sort of like modeling putty was um, used to seal the tube and then it was snaked through a sink past the, uh, the P-trap and then somehow the uh, modeling putty was dislodged so that the vapor or air sample could be collected. So these are just some, some uh, examples and there could be other ways to accomplish this. So SVIG attachment four describes groundwater as a line of evidence to evaluate vapor intrusion. 
This attachment includes uh, uh, the equations for groundwater to vapor partitioning and prediction of indoor air concentrations. It also uh, provides some considerations for use of the groundwater line of evidence. In the next three slides, I'm going to walk you through the conceptual model for transport of vapors from the groundwater into indoor air. And we've got a cross section that we're going to work through. So first up, I just want to give you the overall two-step process for how we handle this mathematically. So first, we partition the VFCs in groundwater to vapor phase using equilibrium partitioning equations. And then second, the vapors have to migrate through the capillary fringe and the soil into the indoor air. We handle this through use of an attenuation factor. For our example, we're going to use tetrachloroethene, or PCE. And so you can see the diagram at the right, the PCE concentration in groundwater is 6.4 micrograms per liter. And so for this step one, partitioning to the vapor phase in blue here, we're going to take the concentration in the groundwater, 6.4 micrograms per liter, and multiply that by the chemical specific unitless Henry's Law constant, which um, you can get that from the US EPA RSL's chemical parameters table. And that comes out to be 4.6 micrograms per liter. That's not a typical unit we use for the vapor phase, right? And so we're, we do a unit conversion, and we end up with 4,600 micrograms per cubic meter. Continuing on with our example, now we're going to take the, um, the concentration of uh, vapors uh, in equilibrium with the groundwater, 4,600 micrograms per cubic meter. Multiply that by an attenuation factor to represent the transport through the capillary fringe and the soil into the indoor air. And here we're using the US EPA groundwater attenuation factor of 0 0.001. And so that gives us a prediction or an estimate of the concentration of indoor air at 4.6 micrograms per cubic meter. So let's wrap up discussion of attachment four with considerations for when to use the groundwater line of evidence for vapor intrusion evaluations. So typically it's not our first choice when evaluating VI because of uncertainties about equilibrium partitioning and transport through the capillary fringe. So in general, if you have vadosone to work with, we would rather sample soil gas and directly measure what's in the, the vapor phase. However, if groundwater is shallow, the groundwater line of evidence may be our only viable subsurface line of evidence choice. When sampling groundwater for evaluating VI, the preferred sample location would be near the top of the water table. Uh, that's going to be most, most representative of what's going to partition into the vapor phase and tra transport towards a building. For situations where contaminated groundwater is in contact with the building, uh, for instance, we're seeing a lot more subterranean garages these days. The US EPA groundwater attenuation factor may not be applicable. Thank you for viewing the SVIC training. For questions, please contact the Cal EPA VI workgroup by DTSC or Waterboards VI email. For additional VI resources, please visit DTSC or Waterboards VI webpages. We hope you have a good one.